3D printing has changed the world. It definitely has. I don't think that there's any argument against it, but I would actually like you to try to argue against that in the comments because maybe it's really not that big of a deal, but to me, it seems like a pretty big deal. Now, you may think this video is gonna be talking about 3D printing, and it kinda is, but I'm really gonna talk about Magnum Motors and how 3D printing helped me go from prototype into production, and it filled a gap that, okay, I could've filled it myself, but running a CNC machine for little parts like this so that I can build these motors just wasn't really affordable. And it was also a lot of time and trying to hire somebody to work a CNC machine, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, how should I start? I will start by telling you how I used to make Magna motors. I think that's a good start. So originally when I came up with the Magna motors, it's, it's not exactly like a, a totally new or fresh design. There's been plenty of motors that use neodymium magnets with larger rotors in them. But what I did was I just generated something from scratch based on some parts that were available. So we have these armatures which aren't actually available in magnums anymore. We've gone all to five slots. But as you can see, it's really big as compared to a normal armature, which I don't have around here, but just take my word for it, 28 millimeters versus 23. And as you can see inside the can, there's lots of room inside. And I originally just got your, your basic 540 can, empty, no magnets, and then I installed the magnets myself. And what I was using originally was actually a set of spacers and jigs that I made. And part of it was I, I hired a machinist and they made some cones for me and the cones kind of like fit in and it gives a certain depth for the magnets. And then there was these T-bars. So I would insert a T-bar in between, had to make sure that it was real waxed up so it didn't stick. So we'd stick a T-bar in between those magnets that would space them out. I machined all the T-bars myself. Uh, so it's, it's not something that would get consumed with each motor, but I machined, you know, 10 of them so we could do a tray of 10 at a time. I would put a shaft through the middle, just the shaft only, nothing else. And then we would put this on top. So we had these multiple parts that kept the magnet spaced. It kept it uh, centered. And then we had that T-bar that was installed with the motor. But with a, a, a T-bar, and I say a T-bar because it was shaped like a T, you, you couldn't have it stay in the motor for too long. And these magnets are so strong. There we go. Uh, you couldn't have the T-bar stay in there, which is, you, you see those little silver spacers in there. Those are actually magnets. This is a semi uh, what would it be called? I don't remember the term right now. I'll remember it later. At any rate, if you didn't pull that T-bar out in time, it would end up fusing itself into the motor and both your jig, my jig, and the magnet and the motor and everything is all ruined. So I had to find that perfect amount of time when the epoxy, because we use a two part for this, when it wasn't quite set, but it was set enough to be able to yank the jig out, the spacer. And a huge hassle, but it worked. It absolutely worked. It worked really well. The next version that I did was this. And we used these actual magnets as spacers, and those magnets helped create a haulback array. It's not a complete haulback array, but it was still better than nothing, and it worked pretty well. But magnets themselves don't really have good precision because of the way that they're made. It's like point one millimeter plus or minus or 0.05 millimeter plus or minus and in terms of a motor that's going to act the same at least on startup from one to the next to the next to the next over let's say a batch of 100 there's going to be a lot of variation in it and not only is there variation in the spacers being magnets there's also variation in the actual magnets themselves and that variation made it to where there was just always a little bit of play or they just didn't fit and then you have to mix and match end up spending just as much, if not more time, trying to get that to fit than using the whole T-bar method. So the next method that I came up with, still using the same style of using stock off-the-shelf cans, and for the shorty, for the stubby versions, I would cut them down on a lathe and then repunch our little nubbins to hold the in bell here. The next thing that I did was 3D printing, and this was the stopgap that I really, really loved and needed. So the 3D printing, yeah, it doesn't have maybe the best tolerances on it, but 
it's pretty repeatable. And if I can get within 0.05 millimeters, which with most printers, if you don't go too fast, it's pretty easy. Then what I've found is that we could put it in there. And if we, if we needed to oversize a little bit and let's say hit it with a lighter on an edge to soften it so it would go in, it's super easy. Or just take a little knife, cut down the edge, boom, super easy. Dealing with the tolerances wasn't difficult at all. And it's pretty dang symmetrical. So what I ended up doing was I'd print these guys, these little plastic spacer pieces, and then we would shove them down into the base of the motor can. Then you put the magnets in, these little tabs, uh, maybe you can see it against the table here. These little tabs acted as our T-bar, our T-spacer in equivalent essentially, or the same as what I used with the magnets on this and then it got glued into the can. So these were consumables, but this is like a penny, maybe a penny of material, and I can do a plate of these guys in an hour, far faster than we could actually assemble the motors. So this would get glued down into the bottom of the motor. It acted as the magnet spacer, and then once the glue was actually set, these things, they're just trapped in there, but they're actually doing no work because the glue, the two-part epoxy, is what's doing all the work I hold the magnets in. So the fact that this would soften with heat, it's irrelevant at that point. It was great, absolutely great. And we made many, many, many of them like this. And after long enough time, I basically said, well, people seem to like the Magnum, so let's make the Magnum into its own motor. And this one's a, a scratched up can. But what I ended up doing, you can't really tell by looking at it, but the can itself is, self jigging for the magnets. So instead of having something that inserts during assembly, the can itself, which is half steel and half aluminum, the center section is the back iron is made of steel. And then this part is actually a single part aluminum and the face inserts through. And on the inside, maybe you can see, maybe you can't see, there is a section of aluminum right there that spaces the magnets, but it also holds the can together and it holds this top portion on. So now instead of having to punch in the little holdy nubs for the end bell, it's actually machined into this piece and it is part of the can that is not only rigid, but self jigs the magnets. And I don't think that I would have been able to get to this point without this, because we were able to make enough motors quickly enough just because of the 3D printed plastic piece helping us self jig the motor during assembly. We were able to make enough motors and sell enough motors to say, hey, these are actually popular. But when I was doing them all the other ways, it was so slow and tedious that we just literally couldn't make enough to judge if the market wanted them. It, it was uh, kind of a weird position to be in, but uh, change the world. I really feel like 3D printing when used in certain ways is a game changer. And I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to play that word out or that, that phrase of being a game changer, but for this particular product, absolutely. It made it to where we were able to take it to the next level. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to. So as you can see this, and now we do gold plated magnets. Cause I mean, gold plated magnets that doesn't offer any performance benefits, but it does offer benefit of corrosion resistance, which is nice on motors like this. So essentially the can can last forever, but we have this machined into the can self jigging system that I don't even know if I would have come up with without this being an intermediary step. And it is, you know, ready to go from the assembler because we're not currently assembling these in house i have them machined and assembled at a motor assembly house that's what they do but we could always assemble them here if we needed to but for the time being so that we can focus our labor on other things we are actually getting these assembled to my specs in a just a perfect manner. And of course we do the final assembly. So we wind up the blank armatures. We do all the terminations. We do all the balancing. We do all the final assembly ourselves, but essentially this is now ready made for us. I have these ready made for us. And then these we make, or you could say assemble in house. And then all the final pieces come together. It's been, it's been a journey to say the least. So yeah, hey, there you go. 3D printing, slowly changing the world one product at a time, at least in this case, but now we're, we're not even using the 3D printed parts. So I don't know, is it a moot point or is it not? It's just a little history on the Magnum motor and how 3D printing really made it come to market. So 
if you got any questions, leave them down below. I know I just talked at you for however many minutes about random things, but maybe you find that as interesting as I do. I really love manufacturing and design for manufacturing. It's something that is near and dear to my heart because I love designing things. And if you can design them for manufacturing in a way that goes together every single time, the exact same or at least close to the exact same within the tolerances that are specified, then it's, it's almost magical. And maybe we can say that technology is practically magic at this point, especially if you don't understand it. So there you go. Bag mountains. How do they work? Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. You've made it to the end of the video. Hopefully that means you liked what you saw. If you want to help out the channel, you can like, subscribe, and definitely comment down below. We would like to hear new ideas from you, so be sure you let us know what you'd like to see. There are some other suggestions probably floating by my head right now that you can check out. And otherwise, we appreciate your support and your help growing the channel.